Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth and we receive it written in our heart and our mind. Thank you for the revelation that you're continuing to bring forth. We are doers of the word. We will see the fruit of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you on the subject of covenants. We talked about understanding covenants. We talked about many things that are important to understand about how conditions, there's conditions for covenants. We must meet them if we're going to see them come to pass and how God views a covenant. We've most recently been talking about aspects of covenants. We've seen that the name of the Lord is that name, the covenant keeping name of the covenant, which in the New Testament is the name of Jesus. The word is the word of the covenant, which is, shows forth the responsibility of the parties, which would be God having his responsibility and we having our responsibility. We talked about the table of the covenant, which is not written in stone any longer. Now it's written on the tables of our heart, the word is. We talked about the book of the covenant, which contained the word of God. It contains all the things that about us were to be written in that book and to see that we are staying in that book all the days of our life. We also talked about the fact that when they were obedient to the word, to do what they were to obey and carry out the word, then the blood of the covenant was applied to them. When you and I walk in the light, the blood of Jesus will be applied by Jesus, keeping us in right relationship with him. Also, we talked about the fact that these covenants were age during, not everlasting. We pointed out five scriptures and five reasons why it, the word everlasting should mean age during, because it speaks of particular ages when it's in effect. We also saw that we're expected to keep the covenant or to carry out the things that we are supposed to do and that God wants to establish the covenant in us. The establishment in it is for him to accomplish all that he purposes, especially to get us to increase, to abound, fruit, more fruit, much fruit, conquering, overcoming, coming in our life. We also talked about, and last time we were together, there's negative aspects as well about a covenant. It's possible for one to forget the covenant or to transgress the covenant or to break the covenant. And if so, then the vengeance of the covenant, which is part of it, will go into operation and the curses of the covenant will come upon a person. There are blessings and there are cursings upon a, in a covenant relationship. Tonight we're going to talk about the blessings of the covenant and the promises of covenant and the necessity of you being steadfast in the covenant to see God accomplish the things that he purposes. We see in Hebrews 8 verse 6, speaking about Jesus, now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he's the mediator of a better covenant which is established upon better promises. We now have promises in the new covenant that are better than the old. The old covenant did have promises that would bring blessings upon them. And there were blessings upon the covenant. We see this clearly shown when we see in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, he says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. There is blessing and there's also cursing, as well as life and death. Whatever we choose is what we are going to see. Now, when we carry out our responsibilities of doing what the Word says, the Word of the Covenant, then we're going to see the blessings. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 says, It shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command you this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. So we have our part to play, which is hearkening and obeying what he says in his word. At the same time, <clears throat> when we do that, then God has his heart, part to play, which is the blessings will come on us and overtake us. That's God's performing of the word. Notice, they'll not only come on us, they'll overtake us, they'll get us. That means you can't even get away from them because God is a performer of his word once you meet the conditions. We also did mention the fact that there are curses will come the same way, though, as far as overtaking us. Deuteronomy 28, 15. It'll come to pass if you will not hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, that all these curses shall come on thee and overtake thee as well. God, of course, wants us to be blessed. 
and there are blessings of the covenant that we are to see come to pass. Jesus came, remember, to make a, not only to accomplish redemption, but to make a new covenant. And by making a new covenant between the Father and himself, of which he came into through spiritual birth, as far as seeing that come into manifestation and having force, he had to die as the testator first, and then he then was born, the firstborn from the dead, bringing that himself into that covenant relationship. What did he come to do? He wants to bring forth blessings upon us. God's purpose is to see a blessing come. Acts 3, 26. <laughs> Unto you first God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you. He wants to bless us. God does not want us to have curses. He wants us to have blessings of all types. Notice, he says, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities, we do have to turn away from iniquities, or that will bring curses. We do have a responsibility to walk in line with the word. We also saw in Hebrews chapter 6, when it speaks of God making this covenant in verse 13, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. God wants to bring blessing, and his promise is to bring blessing in your life. Well, we see that now that the New Testament has come into being, now the, the blessings have already actually been given to us in Christ in the covenant relationship. And we are to take hold of them, possess them, do what's necessary to see them come to pass. Ephesians 1.3 makes it very clear. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heaven, heavenly places in Christ. That means the blessings have already been given to you as part of your right as an inheritance in Christ. You are an heir of all things because Jesus is an heir of all things and you're in him. And these are all the spiritual blessings that have been given to us. They have already been given to us. Well, if they've already been given to us, then how are they going to come into manifestation? Well, we are going to have to do our part to see them come to pass. And this is where it comes to the point of you being a doer of the word consistently, which is what causes the blessings then to come into manifestation in your life. James 1.22 But be, or this really means become, the word ginomai in the Greek, become, and this is to be an ongoing work that accomplished in your life. It is a present tense verb, which means continuous, ongoing action. You're to become continually, and it's a command, be in the imperative mood, become continually doers of the word. Not hearers only, or you'll deceive your own selves. And he comes down to verse 25, and he says this, Whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty, which is the New Testament law of Christ that we, you and I are under, and continues therein as we do what the word says, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed, or actually this means in his doing, as Young's brings out. Otherwise, as you're doing the word, that's what's going to release the blessings to come to pass. You do your part, God will do his part. The blessings will come on you and overtake you in your life. Now these blessings, we need to see that they're all shown that they will come to pass in our life because of God's promises. And you must know that in the covenant, there are promises of the covenant. And knowing that God has promised, you should have absolute assurance that he's going to bring his promises to pass and these blessings will come upon you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. It says, At that time you were without Christ, before being born again, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise. Notice, there's covenants of promise. God promises when he promises, that means he's going to do it. When someone promises they're going to do something, you know they're going to do it. They have, they have declared that they're going to carry that out. Having no hope without God in the world until, of course, we get born of God, born again. Now we have come into covenant relationship, and the covenants of promise are now available to us. God has great 
promises that he has given unto us. And there's promises of the covenant. We see Luke 172, he said, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. God is a God who remembers his covenant. And what does he do? He performs the mercy. He is merciful and he brings forth his blessings. The mercy of God is the love of God in action to perform the word, which is to bring forth these promises into manifestation in our life. We see in the Old Testament there were promises. And remember, we're in the New Testament has better promises than the Old. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 3. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee. He gave a promise. When God gives a promise, you can trust in him. You can have faith in him and know that he is faithful who has promised. Knowing that it's God's promise, should have you, you should have absolute confidence that what he says he will bring to pass when you do your part. We see in Deuteronomy chapter 12, over in verse 20, when the Lord thy God shall enlarge thy border as he hath promised thee. That was increase, wasn't it? That's what God wants for you. Thus shalt thou say, I'll eat flesh because my soul longeth to eat flesh. Thou mayest eat flesh whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. Otherwise they were blessed. They had more and they were able to have partake of whatever they had need of. God will enlarge you in all aspects of your life to increase you, to bless you, to give you abundance in your life. Deuteronomy 15, verse 6. For the Lord thy God blesseth thee as he promised thee. And thou shalt lend unto thee many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. Thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. So the blessing of God is, as his promise is said, that he's going to bless you so much that you'll even be able to lend instead of borrowing. You won't have to, need to. And you'll be, you'll be reigning instead of them, not reign, instead of people reigning over you. And of course, in the New Testament sense, God is going to bless us, so we are going to have abundance. All of our needs will be met. And also, we will be reigning over the enemies instead of the enemies reigning over us. We see in Joshua, chapter 22, the covenant's a promise. You must realize that in this covenant relationship, God has promised. And whenever he's promised something, you should know that he's going to bring it to pass. Joshua 22, verse 4. Now the Lord your God hath given rest unto your brethren as he promised them. And we promised and then he made good on it. He accomplished it. He gave them rest. God performed it. He had all these promises and always came through with them. Therefore now return you, get it into tents and land your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of Jordan. So they got rest. He will give us rest as he has promised. Chapter 23, verse 5. The Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you, this is all the enemies, and drive them out of your sight, and you shall possess their land as the Lord your God hath promised unto you. God just didn't say, go in and fight and see whether you can get it. No, he says, I promised to give this land. That means God is going to cause you to gain victory over your enemies as you go forth to attack them. And in the New Testament, what are we going to do? We're going to cast out the demons and God's going to drive the demons out and we are going to possess our promised land, the promises of God, as God has promised us that he will perform these things. We come down to verse 9. He said, The Lord hath driven out from before you great nations and strong, but as for you, no man has been able to stand before you unto this day. Well, the man, remember, is a type of the physical enemies that were there, which was pointing towards the physical enemies, which is a type of the spiritual enemies that you and I are fighting against, which from a New Testament application would be no evil spirit. We'll be able to stand before you all the days of your life, certainly. One man of you shall chase a thousand. You do have to get after them. But notice, as you go after him, the enemies to attack them, who fights for you? He says, for the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you, as he hath promised you. The battle's the Lord's, and the victory is ours. Our job is to fight a good fight of faith, of continually believing, speaking, doing what he says. But in the spirit, God is the one who is fighting against the enemies for you. He will fight for you, 
And notice it's as he promised you. You know that God's going to come on the scene. He's going to fight against your enemies because he has made a promise to us. That's why I said, take good heed to your, therefore unto yourselves that you love the Lord your God. Of course, we have to meet the conditions and walk in line with his word if we're going to see God bring these great bless, blessings to pass. He goes on in verse 12 and he says, Else if you go back, do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them and go in unto them, and they to you know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you. Otherwise, if you go back into the ways of sin or back into bondage or go back into things that you, sh that you came once were delivered from, you're not going to see God bring a victory for you, and, and of course, until you'd come to repentance. What will happen? These are the evil spirits that will come back in. There will be snares and traps unto you, scourges in your sides, thorns in your eyes, till you perish from off the good land which the Lord your God hath given you. Well, God wants us to get victory. He says, Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you. Not one thing hath failed thereof. That is the confidence you should have because he has promised, and he has given you the promises of the covenant, the blessings that he will bring these things to pass in your life. Therefore it shall come to pass that as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you. Again, this is God's promise. You must think of God's promise when you are praying the word or doing the word or acting on the word, knowing that he's going to bring it to pass. And then he says, So shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things, so you have destroyed you from all this good land, which the Lord your God hath given you. This talks about the curses will come if we do not do the things that he says. When you transgress the covenant of the Lord, you commanded you, have gone served other gods, bowed yourself to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given unto you. God is, a, remember, a performer of his word, and we know that covenants have both blessings, and they also have curses. He expects us to choose the way of the Lord. And remember, we talked about this once before, but if we don't obey and do the things that God says, there will be repercussions. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 34, this was the penalty that came to them, because remember, they were told to go out and search the land, weren't they? How many days did they go to search the land? Forty days. And they brought back the fruit. And then when they were supposed to go in and possess it, only Caleb and Joshua brought the good report that we're well able to go up and possess it. The other ones said they weren't able to possess it. They believed the enemies were stronger than them. They saw the giants and they saw themselves as grasshoppers and said the enemy even saw us as a grasshopper. Well, that was wrong. They did not obey God. Look what it says happened to them. Verse 34. After the number of the days in which you search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall you bear your iniquities even 40 years, and you shall know the breach of my promise. Breaking the covenant to stop God's promises from coming to pass in their life, they were breaching the promises of God. They were hindering him. In fact, instead, they end up getting a judgment. How long were they in the wilderness? 40 years. A, day, a year for every day that they went and searched out the land. We told you it was the same thing that happened with Israel. Israel that would not keep the seventh year Sabbath of the land. They didn't do it over a 490 year period. And because they were supposed to do it every seven years, seven into 490 would mean 70 times they didn't do it. Well, how many years did they go into Babylonian captivity? 70 years. Uh, 70 years, a year for each one of those years that they did not keep that and obey. And then after they came out, we pointed out to you that they didn't do it then. They didn't repent after they came out of the Babylonian captivity. And because of that, their punishment was seven more times, as the word says. And they ended up then, it was 2,520 years was the remaining amount of the curse that they had to pay, which was the time that they could not become a nation. And we pointed out that that came all the way up to 1948. 
That's the reason Israel couldn't become a nation. And it wasn't because suddenly they just did things to cause it. It was God's word that came to pass. The curse came upon them. The promises of them having a nation was stopped until the, that time period had elapsed. God is a performer of his word. Well, we see that. If he's a performer of his word when we see their disobedience, we should also have confidence that he's a performer of the word from obedience. When there's been obedience, he performs the word as well. And he will absolutely bring the promises to pass in your life. We need to believe his word and know that what he promised, he will bring to pass. 1 Kings chapter 8. Knowing that he promised, we should never be an, out, an unbelief. We should never doubt. We should never draw back or waver or wonder if God's going to do it. He promised he will do it. 1 Kings 8, 21. I have set there a place for the ark. Wherein is the covenant of the Lord? The ark was called the ark of the covenant. That's where the covenant of the Lord was put in as they put the tables of the covenant in there. It said, which he made with our fathers when he brought them up out of the land of Egypt. And so the Ark of the Covenant was the place where God would manifest himself in the Old Testament. We see in Numbers chapter 10, talking about the Ark of the Covenant. It said they departed from the Mount of the Lord three days' journeys, and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days' journeys to search out a resting place for them. God manifested his presence in the Ark of the Covenant. And notice... It was the ark where his manifest presence was of the covenant. Otherwise, he was performing what the, the promises of the covenant, carrying it out as he went to search out a place for them. He also would fight the enemies. Verse 35, it came to pass when the ark set forward, Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered. Let them that hate thee flee before thee. And he would fight against their enemies, and they would be conquered. He would do what we said we're supposed to do in the word. Numbers chapter 14, verse 44, talking about the Ark of the Covenant. They presumed to go up in the hilltop, and none that nevertheless the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Could they win their battle? No. This is because they were in sin. The Ark of the Covenant was the where the manifest presence of God was when you met the conditions of the covenant. You had to walk in line with what the covenant said. You had to be a doer of the word. In this case, God wasn't going to do anything. And of course, the Malachites came down and, and smote them and discomfited them, and they did not win their battle because they were in sin. We also see the Ark of the Covenant in Deuteronomy chapter 8, 10, that is, verse 8. At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear or to carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Who were the Levites? They were the priests. Who are the priests today? You and I are. Remember, the presence of God could not dwell in them, so they would carry that where the presence of God was manifest in the Ark of the Covenant. Now, you and I are the priests. Where is he dwelling? Within us. You and I are carrying the presence of God in us. He's come to dwell in us. We need to realize that. We need to get God inside minded. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and you are carrying the Ark of the covenant, the manifest presence of God, and he will manifest in you when you meet the conditions of the covenant. If you don't, you won't see things come to pass. We also see another thing about the Ark of the Covenant. Deuteronomy 31, verse 26. He said, take this book of the law, put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. In other words, the word, which was in the book of the law, was in there. If they would walk contrary to it, that word that was in the Ark of the Covenant would be a witness against them, or if they saw curses come upon them, it would be the witness against them. Why? Because they were not performing the word in their life. God wants us to understand that God is only going to manifest himself when we are operating in line with the covenant. And that's what was happening back there when the Ark of the Covenant was in, in the Old Testament era. First Chronicles chapter 22, verse 19, interesting statement it makes. Set your heart and your soul 
to seek the Lord your God. Arise, therefore, and build ye the sanctuary of the Lord God to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God into the house that is to be built to the name of the Lord. Well, how does that apply for us today? You and I are to set our heart and soul to seek the Lord or to seek him diligently. And what are we going to do? We're going to build the spiritual house of God, the sanctuary of the Lord, the sanctified holy place. And what will that do? Just as here it brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and holy vessels in to manifest in the place. In like manner, when you and I build the holy sanctuary, the spiritual house of God in us, then we will see the manifest presence of God come forth in us because, of course, we become holy vessels before the Lord. He certainly will not manifest himself in the midst of those who are walking in sin, but he will manifest himself in those who will be holy and walk in his ways and when you're walking in line with the covenant. And that's what it shows. The Ark of the Covenant was where God would manifest himself when they were walking in line with the word. Hebrews 9, verse 4, interesting, says, speaking of what was in the Ark of the Covenant, which had the golden censer, and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein there were three things. There was the golden pot that had the manna, well, that's a type of the word that was to feed them. Remember, that's what was feeding them daily. God's word is to feed you daily, to strengthen you so you can be strong spiritually and walk in the ways of the Lord and keep the covenant. The second one was Aaron's rod that budded. Remember when the, the ones that were the people involved in witchcraft and the enchanters and all those ones, they threw down their, their rods and... They became serpents, and what did Aaron's rod do? It swallowed up their rods, didn't it? That means Aaron's rod that budded speaks of God who will swallow up and conquer all the devil's works and attacks that would come against you and defeat all your enemies. The next was the tables of the covenant. The tables of the covenant, of course, is the word of the covenant. And where is it written now? It's written in our heart. And the New Testament says it's written in our heart and mind, and this reveals the responsibilities of us to carry them out and also the promises that God will bring to pass. So what was in this Ark of the Covenant shows what's supposed to be happening in us. We're to be eating the Word, feeding on the Word daily to have spiritual strength. We're going to be releasing the authority, power of God according to the promises that belong to us and conquering the enemies in our life which is God manifests himself to swallow up all the evil spirits' activities against us. And we're going to have this word in our heart and mind, and we're going to carry it out so we perform our responsibilities so we see the covenant promises come to pass. We see another scripture about the promises over in 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56. Blessed be the Lord, that hath given rest unto his people Israel, according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses' his servant. So you get confidence in God. It's not just confidence in him. It's confidence in what he has done. He promised. If he promised, he's going to bring it to pass. Not one thing that he promised failed to come to pass. Everything did. Anything that God has promised to do, you should know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is absolutely going to bring it to pass. In the New Testament, of course, we've come into being born again. We've come into relationship with him. And what's the first thing that we should see of a promise coming to pass in our life? It's receiving the Holy Spirit. It's revealed in Ephesians chapter 1 in verse 13. It says, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when we get born again, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit is a promise. That is the promise of the Father that is we are to receive once we're born again. And remember, it's the earnest or the first fruit of our inheritance that belongs to us in Christ. So it is a promise. And in the New Testament, all these blessings have been given to us as promises from God that he will perform in our life. 2 Corinthians 1.20 All the promises of God in him are yea, yes, 
and in him, amen, so be it, unto the glory of God by us. That means every promise is yes. There's no no's or no maybes. Everything he says, he will do. You need to have that absolute confidence. At the same time, remember, we still have our responsibilities. Here's a good example of it. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved. So we got this promise. We know what God will do. Well, is there something we need to do? Yeah. Let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That implies that this has to be done by us to see the promises come to pass, which means we've got to get rid of all the filthiness of the flesh, which are all the sin areas, get rid of them all out of our life, sins of the flesh, and the filthiness of the spirit, which are the evil spirits that have come into us from the open door of sin, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So as you meet the conditions of having the fear of God, you deal with all the filthiness of the flesh, you confess sin, repent of it, turn away from it, you turn away from yielding to the flesh, you get your mind renewed and walk in line with the word, you crucify the flesh daily, and you cast out the evil spirits, what's going to be the result is you get rid of all the filthy, unclean spirits, you're going to perfect holiness in the fear of God. Then you're going to see the promises come to pass. Otherwise, God will perform his promise, but you and I have a part to play to carry it out. We must do what he says. Ephesians chapter 3 even tells us in verse 6 that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, or this really means through. It's a word dia in the Greek, which means through. So how do you get this, these become a partaker of the promise? Through the gospel which is the good news of the Word of God. That's why hearing the Word is absolutely essential so you get revelation knowledge of the things that God will give to you and you become a partaker of it through the Word of God that you receive. We see in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2, where it talks about honor thy father and mother. This is the first commandment with promise. What does that tell you? That tells you that with the commandments, also come promises. God didn't give you a commandment and then nothing's going to happen when you obey the commandment. No, a commandment has a promise hooked in with it. That's why when you learn the commandments and you carry them out, you're going to, there's a promise that's going to go with it. And you see it time and time again. If you do such and such or commands telling you to do such and such, then God will carry out his promise. Commandments are tied in with a promise of what God will perform. And here it is here, in this case, that it may be well with you, that thou mayest live long on the earth. Otherwise, if we will meet the, what God says and carry out his commandment, the promise is he's going to bring these blessings upon us in our life. We see another place over in 1 Timothy. So when you're keeping commandments, you've got to know, hey, there's a promise here for me. And I need to be ready to take hold of that or to expect that or believe or do what's necessary to see that come to pass. 1 Timothy 4.8 Bodily exercise profits little. It does profit, but it profits little. Don't major on it. But godliness is profitable unto all things. That's what you major on. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So what should we be majoring on? Godliness. God wants us to have godliness in our life. And how do we have godliness? It's going to be for what you do with the word in your life. We'll see this in a moment. 2 Timothy 1.1 1, 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life that's in Christ Jesus. This is the promise of God's Zoe life. There's no life outside of Jesus Christ. The bios, physical life we have, is not life in essence, really, because when you're, you die, your spirit leaves, you're dead. You're, you don't, the bios life is nothing. The life you have is because of God, because of the spirit that is within you. And when you have Jesus Christ come in you, your spirit is from a spirit that's under dominion of the devil. You get a brand new spirit, and now you're in Christ, and you have life that has come from him. Titus chapter 1. 
Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the, it says acknowledging of the truth. This is not a good translation because this is not talking about a participle. It would be, you see it would be a participle. Instead, it's a noun. And it means the precise and correct knowledge. So he's saying, according to the faith of God's elect and the precise, correct knowledge of the truth. That's what it really says. The precise, correct knowledge of the truth, which is what you and I are to get from the Word, which is after godliness. What's that tell you? How do we get to the place of godliness? Well, what's, af what's after godliness that's going to produce it? The precise, correct knowledge of the truth. As you get the precise, correct knowledge of the truth, you get it in you and you hear and do it, that will produce godliness in your life. And that's what he wants. In hope of eternal life, because remember, the promise is that we would have life and godliness is profitable for all things, not only now, but also in the life to come. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, promised before the age began. This is the word aeonios, aeonios, which refers to the age. It's from the word aeon, talking about, or as it's, it's plural actually, as Young brings out, before the times of the ages, before the ages began. God has promised these things. All these promises have already been set, and you and I are supposed to enter into them. In fact, we're to enter into all the promises of God. The promises of the covenant is what they are. You see, they're not just promises. Think of them as promises of the covenant. Hey, this is the covenant that I have with God, that God's promise that he'll perform. This is a sure thing. He's the guarantor who will perform these in my life. Hebrews 4.1 Let us therefore fear, the fear of the Lord, lest a promise be in left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. We're not supposed to come short of anything or come behind, essentially this means. We're supposed to possess all the promises. He goes on in verse 2 and says, For unto us was the gospel preached. Remember, the promises come through the gospel, the word, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. That tells us another important thing. We have these promises. We're to possess them to enter into the rest that God has. We're not supposed to come short of them. The key will be mixing your faith with what you heard. Otherwise, applying the word, doing what it says, working your faith. And when you do that by being a doer of the word, then the word which has been preached unto you, which will produce the promises, will profit you because you mix it with your general spirit of faith by believing it and speaking it and or doing what the word says to bring it to pass. That's what God wants. He wants us to enter into all the promises. In fact, we see this, the word promise used some four times down here in these verses in, in Hebrews 6.11 that also tells us some important things about the promise of the covenant. 11, 6.11 We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and Patience, it says, inherit the promises. Now, this tells us also something. The promises that we have are part of our inheritance because we've come into covenant relationship as we were born into it. Remember, Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. You and I are born from the dead, and he became the heir of all things. You and I are heirs of God, joint heirs with him. All these promises are part of the inheritance that belongs to you in Christ. Now, when it says inherit the promises, it is a word that is in the present tense, indicating it means ongoing action. Young's translates it very well, saying, are inheriting the promises, showing the ongoing action and work of seeing this come to pass. So, it says, through faith and patience, they are inheriting the promises. The word patience, we need to understand what it says. It is the word macrothumia in the Greek. It is not the word that really is normally translated patience in the New Testament. That's the word hupomone, which means steadfastness 
or constancy. The word used here is macrothumia. It should be translated long-suffering. Fourteen times it's used in the New Testament. Twelve times it's translated correctly, long-suffering. Two times patience erroneously. The normal word for patience is hupomone, which means steadfastness. This is really talking about long-suffering. Long-suffering is what the word means. So, this is saying we can't be slothful or lazy, but we're to be followers of them. Through, how did they get these promises? Through faith and long-suffering are inheriting the promises, showing the process. This is why, as you apply your faith, you keep your faith applied, but there's going to be a long-suffering that's involved because as your faith is working, whether it's casting out demons, seeing a healing, seeing a mountain be removed, whatever it might be, you're going to have to be long-suffering in the face of the circumstances that haven't changed yet or until you see the promise come into manifestation. This is why you continually are casting out and you haven't seen it yet. You're long-suffering in the face. You may still have a physical problem or something going on in your mind or some hindrance of some sort, but you keep on applying your faith with long-suffering and then those are the ones that are inheriting the promises. Long suffering is one of the fruit of the Spirit. This is why don't get weary in well-doing. You, whatever you're sowing, you're going to reap in due season if you faint not. People that get, are long suffering will not faint. People that are not long suffering, they faint easily, they quit, they throw in the towel, they give up. That's a mistake. We cannot be slothful but we're to be followers through faith and long-suffering. We are inheriting the promises. When God made promise to Abraham, he could swear by no greater, swore by himself, said, Surely blessing I'll bless thee, multiply and I'll multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, it's the same word, macrothumio, after long-suffering, continually being long-suffering, he obtained the promise. He had got the promise. That tells you it's important. You keep your faith applied continually, but you also must have long suffering in the face of the circumstances that haven't changed yet. Until you've driven out all the demons, or until you've seen a situation change, or you've seen a mountain be removed, or you've seen a healing manifest, whatever it might be. And why is that? Because you've got an enemy that's hindering you. A good example, in the Old Testament even, Daniel's praying. He's praying for 21 days. The angel shows up and says, I've come from the first day. First day I heard your words. How come it took you 21 days to get through? The angels fly and move at the speed of light. In an instant, he said, the prince of Persia hindered me. And he had to have Michael come and fight against him. And then he was able to get through and finally came. It took 21 days and put towards, for that angel to finally get through to him. He had to continue to pray, which is his faith in operation, and he had to be long-suffering. If he'd have thrown in the towel, he wouldn't have seen anything happen. But he did what he needed to do. He continued to have long-suffering, patiently endured, and he saw the angel show up and bring the message that God had for him. Or in, your, in our case, we will see the promise of God come to pass. This is why long-suffering is very important if you're going to see the victory. And he comes down to verse uh, 17, God more will, willing more abundantly to show the heirs of promise. That shows you we're an heir of the promise. The immutability, which means the fixed unalterableness of his counsel, which is of the word that he has given in, the, in his covenant, confirmed it by an oath. He confirmed that he's going to carry out but he said with an oath, he swore by himself, remember, because he could swear by none greater. By two immutable things, it was impossible for God to lie. We might have strong consolation or encouragement and have who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. You are to lay hold upon the confident expectancy of the promises of the covenant coming to pass in your life. And this is where hope it says is to be the anchor of our soul. So we need our soul anchored, and we also need long-suffering in the face of the circumstances, at the same time keeping our faith applied to see the promises come to pass. These are important principles 
that you need to have established if you're going to see the promises. The promises are there, but you must understand they're going to come into manifestation through your faith. There's many things we need to do. Remember, we had to get rid of the filthiness of the flesh and all the filthiness of the spirit, cast out the demons and perfect holiness and the fear of God. There's many aspects to things that we need to do to see the promises come into manifestation in our life. And that is important. Here's another place where we need to understand, like in the area of tithing. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 6. He whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham. It's called Mount Melchizedek. And what happened when he received tithes of Abraham? Abraham's paying tithes to him. Melchizedek is a type of Christ, a type of us paying to him, through him to the Father, is what we do in the New Testament. And he blessed him that had the promises. He brought the tithes, he got blessed. What happens with us? We bring the tithes, the Father opens the windows of heaven, pours out his blessings upon us. So as you're obedient, bringing the tithes is what belongs to him. That's our covenant responsibility. Then what happens then? Then the blessings will come of the promises of God coming to pass in your life. And that's what God wants. We also see over in Hebrews chapter 9, talking about the promise. Verse 15. For this cause, speaking of Jesus, he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, he had to die, remember, to bring that, give force to the New Testament, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called, which would be all of us, might receive, this is the Greek word lambano, might take hold of the promise of eternal inheritance. You have an inheritance that you are to get. And eternal, by the way, is again, age during the time of the ages is what this word means it's referring to. During the age during, Young's brings this out consistently what this means. Because our inheritance is what we take in manifestation during the particular age that it's applicable to. Now, you and I have an inheritance. How do we get this inheritance, remember? Well, we're heirs of God because of the fact of what Jesus got. Hebrews 1, 2, And in these last days he spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Well, if he is the heir of all things, what does that make us? We see over in Romans, chapter 8, and verse 17, it tells us what we are. If children, we get born again, then heirs. That's how we came into the inheritance. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Everything that he is an heir of, you and I are an heir of. We are joint or equal heirs with Christ. All the inherited promises belong unto us, and we are to possess them. But there's also another aspect. If you're going to possess your inheritance, remember you've got to meet the conditions. And here's one of the conditions that you and I must meet if we're going to see our inheritance come to pass. It's conquering and overcoming and carrying off the victory. Look what it says in Revelation 21, 7. He who overcomes, the word overcome, the word nikao means conquer, carry off the victory. When it speaks of conquering and carrying off the victory, this is a present tense verb, meaning he that continually is conquering and carrying off the victory. Ongoing in your life, as you're overcoming anything that comes at you, you can conquer every work of the devil, all sin, all works of the flesh, anything that comes against you. What's going to happen to him? He shall inherit all things. So conquering and overcoming and carrying off the victory is a condition that you and I must meet in order to inherit all the things that have already been given to us. We are an heir of all things, but it doesn't automatically come upon us unless we conquer the enemies in our life. This is why we've got to know our responsibilities, but at the same time we've got to know the promise. The promise is there of, of this, inher this age during inheritance that now belongs to us, that we can possess everything. We just have to make sure we conquer everything so we can inherit all the promises that God has for us. We see something else. See, looking at all these scriptures are important to see how the promise of the covenant will come into manifestation. Otherwise, just because God promised doesn't mean it's automatically going to happen. 
There's conditions, aren't there? We've seen several already. Here we see another. Hebrews 10.23, let us hold fast the profession or the confession. It says of our faith, we'll get to that in a minute, without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Why would we not waver? Because if he promised, we know he's going to do it. And we know because he promised, he would be faithful to it. He's faithful that promised. Trusting in God's faithfulness will be because you know that if he promised it, he's going to bring it to pass. Now, it says without wavering, so there's no reason to waver. If you ever waver, then you really don't know that he's really promised it. And if you knew he promised it, you'd know he'd be faithful to carry it out. When it says faith, by the way, it's the word el peace, which means hope. It shouldn't be translated that. Fifty-four times this word's used in the New Testament. Fifty-three times translated hope correctly. One time erroneously translated faith. Who knows why? They made a mistake. Almost all the translation, you look at almost any translation, they're all translated hope. They all corrected the King James error. You are to hold fast the confession, professioner speaking forth of hope. Because what are you doing? You're speaking the hope which is the promise of God that according to the word and you're speaking it into being the holding fast or speaking forth of your hope is your faith being put in operation and you should never waver why because you know that he is faithful that promised it you have absolute confidence and then here's another aspect of things that are important to see the promises of the covenant come to pass hebrews 10:35 Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has a great recompense of reward. Your confidence will bring a reward. Your confidence in what? In what God's promised in the word of God that he's, you're taking hold of. For you have need of patience, and we'll co cover that in a minute, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So, we got this promise. We can't cast away our confidence in what? in the promise coming to pass. Why, is that, why should we never cast away our confidence? It's a promise of the covenant. God has made a promise, he'll perform it. And we know that if he promised, he'll bring it to pass. It has a great recompense of reward. It will come to pass and bring a blessing upon you in your life. Now this tells us another aspect of what we have need of. We have need of patience. Now this time the word patience is the word normally translated patience, hupomone, which means steadfastness. Remember before, it was macrothumia, meaning long-suffering. In this case, it does mean steadfastness. That you have need of steadfastness, or being constant. And what does that refer to? We'll come back here in a moment. When this speaks of it, this isn't talking about long-suffering in spirit. This is talking about in the soulish realm. In your patience, Luke 21, 19, Possess ye your souls. That's where the mind, will, emotions are operating. Meaning, you need steadfastness in the soulish realm. Steadfastness in your mind. You've got your mind renewed. You're fixed on, you're looking at, you're thinking on what the Word says, and you're doing it. You're not going to waver. In your will, choosing to do what God wants, continually working your faith to see the promise come to pass, and you're governing your emotions so you don't let any feelings cause you to draw back or waver or turn away from anything. You're going to be steadfast. So, in Hebrews, we go back there to chapter 10. We don't cast away our confidence in the promise. We know it has a great recompense of reward. We have need of steadfastness in the soul. At the same time, while, remember, our faith and our long sufferings working. So that tells you there's three important things working when you're going to possess a promise. Your faith's going to be in operation. You're going to be long suffering in the face of the circumstances. But you're also going to be steadfast in the soulish realm so you don't get, lose your hope because that's the area of hope. Patience or steadfastness of hope so you maintain hope. You need to keep speaking the word. That's also, as we talked about, holding fast our confession of hope that after you've done the will of God, you might receive, this is a word, komidzo, which means to carry off. You're going to carry away or carry off the promise. In other words, you're going to see it come to pass. 
You're gonna, this is not Lombano, you taking hold of it. This is God performing it in your life that you might carry off this promise and see it come to pass. So in this case, it's telling us some important things. We don't ever wait, cast away, don't ever cast your confidence in God's promise not coming to pass. It will always come to pass. You need to be steadfast in your soul, coupled together with continuing to put your faith in operation, keep holding fast your confession, speaking forth the word, long suffering in the face of the circumstances, and as you're continually doing the will of God, if you've done the will of God, you will carry off the promise. God will bring it to pass in your life. And that is what he wants for you. We see another case. This is Sarah. Hebrews 11, 11. Through faith also Sarah herself, that meant she had to do something with her faith, received, this is the word lombano, she took hold of. The word strength used next is the word dunamis, which really means power. Sarah herself took hold of power to conceive seed. She was delivered of a child when she was past age. And why? Because she judged him faithful. And what was the basis for her to consider him faithful? He promised. It comes down to the promise of the covenant. If you have a promise of the covenant, then you should know, if you believe God's word, he's faithful to perform it. She judged him faithful and promised. He promised it. I know he's faithful to do it. Now, because of that, she had to do something herself to see God perform the promise. She had confidence faith in, faith in his faithfulness to perform it. But there's something she had to do. And this is where it comes into us understanding we have responsibilities and things we need to do. In this case, she had to take hold of power to conceive seed with her faith. You're going to take hold of power to bring things into manifestation in your life. For instance, you take hold of healing power to flow into your body, don't you? You pray a prayer of faith to take hold of a promise to bring something into manifestation. And that's what you're going to do. You're going to use your faith to take hold of things, to speak them into being. That's why the prayer of faith comes in. Praying to the Father, in the name of Jesus, you bring the scripture promise and you believe you take hold of it, speaking it into being. Sarah took hold of power to conceive seed, to bring forth that which God had promised. So you do the same thing. Whatever God's promised, you're going to take hold of power to cause it to come to pass. You can take hold of that to cause a creative miracle to come into manifestation. Power to produce a creative miracle to perform something. God is a God who is a healer and a deliverer of all things, isn't he? He can do absolutely great things. All things are possible to him that believeth. If you believe, we have the promise and we need to put our faith in operation to see it come to pass. Another thing that we need to look at I'm talking about our, the promise of the covenant. And this is important because many people see the promise, but they don't see all these aspects of the, our sponsor, the responsibilities that we have to see the promise be performed by the Father, bringing it to pass. Look at James 1.12. Blessed is the man that endures the temptation. For when he is tried, bad translation. Here's what the Greek words are. There's two of them. Dokomos, meaning accepted. Ginomai, meaning become. Becoming accepted, or as Young's brings it, becoming approved, same kind of thing. So what this is saying is, blessed is a man that's enduring temptation. For really means because. It's a Greek word, hati, which means because. You can see it below here. Because becoming approved or becoming accepted, and why would that be? Because he overcame the temptation. He endured the temptation. He didn't give place to it. He shall receive, Lombano, take hold of the crown of life. You can take hold of the crown of life because you conquered the temptation and you became approved. 
which the Lord has promised to them that love him. So this is a promise that you can take hold of the crown of life. But we see another thing in here. There's several, there's more, more than just the one responsibility or condition of us conquering the temptation and becoming approved. There's another one to them that love him. Who are the ones that love him? The ones that keep his commandments. Remember John 14, 15? So it's, you guys, this one, when you look at this verse, it's important to realize if you are keeping the commandments of the Lord, showing you love him, if you overcome the temptations that come against you and become approved, then you shall take hold of the crown of life that's promised to you. Otherwise, we have conditions to meet. If we meet them, we'll take hold of it. This is why we've got to know our responsibilities. We also got to know what God will do. And we also must have confidence that this is a promise. It will absolutely come to pass in our life. Here's another one. Also tied into something similar that we just saw. James 2.5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Means this is part of our inheritance. You have an inheritance of the kingdom, which is what? The rule and the reign of God. So, as an heir of the kingdom, and notice what he says, which he hath promised to who? Again, to them that love him. Now that shows us our responsibility again. The same thing as we saw for the one who promised, you know, to, who be able to take hold of the crown of life. It's the same thing here. Who's the one that loves him? The one who keeps his commandments. Otherwise, you are an heir of the rule and the reign of God that's promised to you and me if we're keeping the commandments. If you're not keeping the commandments, that means you're walking in sin, or you're not obeying him. Are you going to be able to rule and reign? No, you're not going to rule and reign over anything. You're going to get wiped out by the enemy. Are you going to possess your inheritance? No. The enemy could be dominating you, even though you have a right to it. You're an heir. You remember, you're an heir, you have an inheritance of all things that you can possess. That's why it tells you you have to conquer the enemy as well as Remember, the guy who conquers and carries off the victory inherits all things, as well as, in this case, keeping his commandments so you can be an heir of the kingdom, so you can be operated in the rule and the reign of God effectively as an heir to see the promises of God come to pass in your life and possess all the things that he has for you. There's another one. We're kind of throwing a lot out at you tonight, but... These are all important in discussing about the promise of the covenant and the blessings coming to pass. Because many people are saying, well, I see all these great promises and blessings. I wonder why they're not happening. Well, because we haven't seen all the conditions and obviously haven't been doing them, otherwise they would be happening. Because remember, when the blessings come, do I have to chase after them and try to shake God down to get them or something? No, they come on you and overtake you, don't they? They just get you. So that means if we do what our part is, it will get performed. Because what does God do? He watches over his word to perform it, doesn't he? It comes to pass. We just have to do what we got to do. So we got to know all these things. Second Peter 1 it says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember, we have all the same spirit of faith, which is like precious faith. You and I have the faith of Jesus. And we're supposed to use that to conquer, overcome, take hold of promises, enter into the rest, all the different things it says. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the precise, correct knowledge of God. Well, that's telling us another one thing else. else. We've got to get the precise, correct knowledge of God. We've got to know the Word, obviously. If you don't know the Word, which is the Word of the Covenant, how are you going to get anywhere? You're not going to get anywhere at all. You've got to know what the, that is. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, how? Through the precise, correct knowledge of him that's called us to glory and virtue. 
In other words, this is telling us that this knowledge that we're supposed to get, uh, his divine power gives us all these things through the knowledge. So that tells you there's power in the word that comes to us through the knowledge. When you get the precise, correct knowledge, the divine power is there in that word that you have received that's for everything you have need of in life and godliness. And what are you supposed to do with that? You're supposed to possess the promises of God in your life by doing what the word says to see him come to pass. And that's what verse 4 says, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, which we're going to possess as we do what the word says, what's, what, what else is going to happen? Here's what God will do. You might be partakers of the divine nature. What does that mean? You're going to become like Jesus. If you're a partaker of the divine nature, you're going to be, that's God manifesting in you. You're going to become like him. And then it also tells us something else, which is obviously implying something we must do, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. You've got to crucify the flesh daily. You cannot be conformed to this world or you're sunk. If you're walking according to the ways of the world or you're, effect, you're affected by the corruption of this world or you, you know, the lust is operated, it works through the world, remember, and it works through the flesh, you're going to get nailed. You'll never possess the promises of God. But as you walk according to the word, the power of God from you getting the precise, correct knowledge of the word that you're hearing and doing and hearing and doing and walking in to possess the exceeding great promises will cause you to be a partaker of the divine nature. Now, there's more that he says after this. How is all this going to work? Because what, else, what are all the things we need to see come to pass? Your faith, remember, it began by talking about you got this faith. Well, what's my faith going to be doing? It's going to be acting on the word to produce all these things. And he says, beside this, giving all diligence. Now, this is telling us our responsibilities. Your responsibility and my responsibility. We've got to be diligent now about what we're about to say. Add to your faith. Besides your faith putting in operation, what else do we need to have in operation? Virtue, which is moral excellence. You can't be running around in sin and think you're going to become a partaker of the divine nature and possess the promises. It isn't going to happen. No, we've got to get rid of it. You conquer sin. Moral excellence. Knowledge. We're going to walk according to knowledge. Temperance, which is self-control. Temperance is that which keeps the flesh in line. And you develop the, the fruit of temperance as you walk in the spirit and don't fulfill the lust of the flesh and you crucify the flesh, you keep that flesh like a slave. Remember, Paul said, I'm going to keep my, this, this body as a slave and I'm going to buffet it and keep it under. I'm not going to let it run me whatsoever. That's how you develop the fruit of temperance in your life, which governs the flesh. And that patience, here's hupomone again, we've seen, steadfast, this is in the soul. So what it's talking about is you get knowledge, you add temperance, which is governing the flesh. You add patience, which is governing the soul, essentially. Steadfast in the soul, on the word. And you get godliness, which was the result of what? Hearing and doing the word, remember, of the precise, correct knowledge of God. You're walking according to the knowledge of God, which we've already seen, that produces godliness. And then you add to that brotherly kindness, which is you showing love for everybody. And to that... Charity, which is love in general for everybody, which is the command we must walk in love. What if, if you get all those things in order, what's going to happen? If these things be in you and abound. Remember, the establishment of the covenant we talked about is when things increase and abound in our life. If they're in you and they're abounding, you, they make you, because God will perform this, see? neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge, the precise, correct knowledge of God, because God is going to take that word that you're acting upon and doing, the precise, correct knowledge of God, and he's going to make you fruitful. He's the one that produces that, remember. If they lack these things, well, then you're in trouble. You're blind. You can't see afar off. You've forgotten you were purged from your old sins. 
So he, then he comes down, he says, wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence. Remember, he said, be diligent now in these things to make your calling and your being chosen, election is the word being chosen, sure, stable, and steadfast. That now is bringing this over into an eternal effect, I mean, an ongoing effect for us, age during, let's put it that way, you know, and what's going to happen to us, we're, we're going to make sure our calling and selection is set, that we're not going to move off of anything. If you do, if you are doing, this would mean, because this is a present tense participle, if you are doing these things, then it says, it says here you shall never fall, but it's not a good translation, unfortunately. Because there's another word underneath this, and it's a subjunctive mood. It literally says, then you might never fall. As long as you keep doing these things. Or you could go out, you can't go in any other areas of sin as well. But the point of all this, if what this is saying, if we go back to it and you see what it's saying. God's given you his faith. You have this faith of Jesus Christ. God's favor and his peace that will produce all these great blessings and promises in your life is to be multiplied to you, and it will come to you through the precise, correct knowledge of God, which has the divine power of God resonant in the word, that as you get this power of the word in you accurately, and you do it, you will possess the exceeding great and precious promises that will cause you to become a partaker of the divine nature and you surely will escape the corruption that's in the world because you will not walk according to any loss. And you're going to give diligence to add to your faith moral excellence, the knowledge, you govern that flesh, you govern that soul, you're a consistent hearer and doer of the word, establishing you and walking in the ways of godliness. You show brotherly love to all the ones in Christ and love to everybody else. And because of that, God makes you fruitful in this, this precise, correct knowledge of God that you're walking after. And as you give diligence to do these things, you make your calling and election sure, stable, and steadfast, that you might not fall as long as you walk in line with the word. That's a tremendous promise. But that's what it's saying. And it's all tied in with a, a cup the becoming like Jesus. That's why you got to go back over that one. <laughs> Every one of us need to go back over that one and get this all down and start doing it really. The, what's the result? When you possess the promises, you're a partaker of the divine nature. You become like him. And that's what we're going to be changed to. And God will perform these things. Now, one other thing that we wanted to talk about, which caught for a couple minutes, is the stead being steadfast in the covenant. That is absolutely essential. If you're not steadfast in the covenant, are you going to see things happen? That's like the guy who throws in the towel. He's not long-suffering. He's not consistent. Or he gets, gets himself into wavering or wondering, is he going to get anywhere? No. This is a part of our responsibility. Psalm 78, look at verse 8. He said, He might not be as their fathers, a stubborn, rebellious generation, a spirit that set not their heart aright. Their spirit was not steadfast with God. Why isn't a person steadfast? From God's standpoint, they haven't set their heart aright or they're stubborn or rebellious. We need to set our heart that we're going to do the things that God says. Verse 37. For their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. There is a steadfastness of the covenant, which is you continuing in it, doing it consistently. You're not on one day and off another day. You're consistent. That shows the heart was not right. A lot of people say, well, I, I know I haven't been very steadfast, but God knows my heart, that my heart's fine. No, it's not. <laughs> That's just a nice little cliche that people have said. You know, 
if we aren't steadfast, then our heart is not right. Because why aren't we? Why weren't we steadfast? How did we get off track? Something must have got out of order. And that shows our heart's not right. We're to be steadfast in everything that we do. We'll look at a few scriptures to show you this. First Corinthians, chapters 15, chapter 15, verse 58. God wants you steadfast, and when we mean steadfast, he talks about being set, firm, fixed, nothing's going to move you. Verse 58, therefore, my beloved brethren, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be steadfast, firm, immovable, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what he expects of us. Colossians chapter 2, verse 5, look what he says. Though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joining, beholding your order. These guys were in order. And the steadfastness of your faith. Hey, they got their life in order. They were steadfast with their faith, working consistently. Remember the scripture we saw in Hebrews already? Chapter 6, verse 19, about hope being the anchor of your soul. Which hope we have is the anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Firm, fixed, nothing is going to move it whatsoever. In fact, in dealing with the devil, how are we supposed to deal with him and resisting him? Not just for a moment and then throw in the give in. 1 Peter 5, 9, whom resist steadfast in the faith. It's the same word. Strong, firm, immovable, solid. Nothing can move you. God wants you resisting the devil firm, fixed, you're never going to give place to him. You're going to resist everything that he brings against you consistently. And what else? Hebrews 3. What's going to happen if we are steadfast? Verse 14. We are made partakers of Christ. Remember what we saw in 2 Peter 1, 4? Partakers of the divine nature. Same kind of thing it's saying. We're made partakers, or we have become, ginomai, partakers of Christ. It's come to pass. If, it'll come to pass, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast, firm, stable, until the end. God's going to bring you to the place, I mean, nothing's moving you whatsoever. You're on the word, you're doing the word, that's it, you're walking that way. You're governing this body, that's all the time. You're governing this soul, that's all the time. You're going to be steadfast here and do the word all the time. You're going to be getting the knowledge of God, working your faith and walking it all the time. You're not going to cast away your confidence ever. You're going to be steadfast. You know, you're going to, you just have to carry it. You're going to carry out that promise. It's going to come to pass. God's going to bring all these things to pass. You're never going to waver. You're going to hold fast your confession. All these scriptures that we've talked about. You're going to endure the temptation. You're going to show that you love him consistently because you keep his commandments. And you're going to be conquering and overcoming everything as you operate in the kingdom, rule and reign of God. You're going to put your faith in operation. You've got to walk. You're going to, you're, you're going to be fruitful in everything. As we saw, essentially, in 2 Peter 1. Everything that you do. One thing we have to do is make sure that we do not fall from our steadfastness. Now it is possible. That's why you've got to set your heart right. You aren't going to let yourself ever fall. 2 Peter 3, 17, You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things, beware, otherwise look out, guard, watch. It's the word philosophy, which means guard yourself. Remember, the devil will try to get to you, or the flesh is what enemy will try to get you to. The same way, not to be steadfast. Beware, lest you also, being led away, deceived, with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastest, firm condition. See, you're going to become so firm, nothing's going to move you. Just the way you are all the time, walking in the ways of the Lord. And when it says fall from the air of the, the, air of the wicked, this is one who broke through the restraint of law and gratifies his lust. So how would you fall from steadfastness? Anytime you get off the word, and you let you get the, the word of God is not now running you, and you broke through the restraint of law, and yeah, the flesh got control over here. That's why it's mandatory to deny yourself and crucify the flesh daily. 
and put the word of God first place that you're going to walk in all of his ways. God has great promises. And we'll look at this one last scripture. What does he say? It's the promise for us. It's in verse 25, I'm sorry. 1 John 5, 225. This is the promise that he's promised us. Eternal, which means age enduring life. Continually, the life of God manifests in us. Remember, he comes to bring us life and more life more abundantly if we meet the conditions. Tremendous things that God will accomplish. This is all because of covenant relationship. But what we've got, gone to tonight was we kind of stepped up a little bit in the aspects of the covenant and the fact that we talked about the blessings and the promises and steadfast, but we also saw all these conditions. You get all these conditions down and get them incorporated in your life and you walk after it, you will see the promises will absolutely come to pass. You're not going to be falling. You're going to be a partaker of the divine nature. You're going to be ruling and reigning over your enemies. You're going to be carrying off all the promises. You're going to enter into his rest that he has for you. You're going to see total victory. You're going to inherit all things, all those scripture promises that we see, all tied in with it. This is why understanding the covenant, our responsibilities, doing what it says, but knowing what God will do, taking hold of power. And one thing, if he promised it, God's faithful, you know he will do it. You should absolutely never waver, wonder at all, ever. If not, that means you really don't understand the promise of the covenant yet. Get in the word and get that established in you and know he's faithful that promised. If someone promised you, you know they're going to do it, especially if they have a track record of it. And God's got a track record of performing everything. There's not one promise that's failed. Nothing. It's all come to pass. Well, it'll come to pass for you and me as well if we'll do the work. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the revelation of covenant relationship. And I understand there are blessings that will come on me and overtake me when I meet the conditions. And there's promises of the covenant that God will bring to pass as I see all the things that I am to do, the conditions to see these promises come into manifestation and I must be steadfast in the covenant, not being moved, firm, fixed, stable, governing everything according to the word of God in my life as I do so. I will see the promises and the blessings of the covenant come to pass in my life. I'll become a partaker of the divine nature. I'll take hold of the crown of life. I will inherit all things. I will see total victory. I will become a partaker of the divine nature like Jesus. I thank you. I will make my calling and my election sure. It'll be set and fixed because I walk according to the covenant and see the promises come to pass. Thank you, Father. I will be a hearer and a doer of this word and I will see the promises and blessings come into manifestation in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you that we have ears to hear, and I thank you that as we tossed, brought out a lot of information, I thank you that we're going to take hold of all these things, get them in operation in our life, and see you fulfill everything that you've said in your word in our life. Thank you. There'll be much fruit as we hear and do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. This is probably a message you'll want to go.